Hey, thank you for inviting me. I, I appreciate the opportunity. I've done this a few times in the past, and I've always enjoyed the experience. Um, it gives me a, a, a chance to talk about stuff that I don't normally get time in my classes and to a, a group of students that I don't always get to work with. So um, thank you again for the opportunity. So I wanted to talk about energy, world energy. This is something that is very relevant to our times, pretty much all times, because without energy, our society doesn't function, right? We know every time the power goes out, our lives go on hold for the most part. Uh, some of you may have come from places where the electricity grid isn't, um, isn't quite as reliable or something like that, but uh, anyway, most of societies, power is a big deal. So where does it come from? Um, actually, first, this is kind of a fun diagram to look at. There's a lot there, and the screen is not very big. So, unfortunately, you probably can't read most of that. But let me just kind of walk you through it a little bit. It's called a Sankey diagram. So this is showing sources of energy, or, ener or different ways of, of producing electricity. And this is the, where, the, the, the places where it gets used. Um, so, for example, you've got petroleum here, about 36% of the electricity in the United States, or power in general, actually, not just electricity. Power in general um, comes from oil. 20, well, I can't even read it. About 30% comes from natural gas, um, about 15% from coal. So those are our fossil fuels, right? That's a big chunk of all the power in this country comes from fossil fuels. And then we've got after that, the next biggest one is nuclear, it's about 9%. And then we've got some other ones that are smaller. Uh, biomass, about 4 And then geothermal, hydro, about 3%. Solar, less than 1%. So these lines show how much of that power goes into generating electricity. So you can see most of it goes right there. Some of it goes directly into transportation. Gasoline for our cars, uh, airplanes, boats, and whatever. Um, some of it goes directly into industrial uses. Uh, some of the electricity goes into residential, commercial, industrial transportation. Here's the scary part, though. So this is energy services. This is energy that's actually used to do something, 30%. Uh, this is rejected energy. That's wasted energy. That's 66%. Uh, Two thirds of all the power that we produce from various means just gets wasted as heat, um, for example, when you transmit electricity through power lines, the resistance in those power lines turns some of that power into heat that just gets wasted to the surroundings, and so on. You burn gasoline in a car, only 20 to 30 percent of the energy from the gasoline actually goes into doing work in the car. The rest is just goes to heating up the car. Didn't you have? No, that, that was my question. Yeah, yeah. So it just—it's just kind of an uh, unavoidable part of generating power. Now, as we get better, we can make that number a little smaller, but it will always be there. So you heat your home, and if you don't have double pane windows and insulation, then right. uh, that kind of thing. Right, or, or more relevantly, if we cool our homes here with a window air conditioner <laughs> unit, and we only have those crappy little jalousie windows, you know, the air just goes right outside, and, and so you're, you're cooling down the rest of the world. And not your uh, yeah, so wasting time. Okay, so. I want to talk about the, the sources of energy that we access. Um, I'm a chemist, and a lot of this has to do with chemistry, so that's why I think it's important. So we've got, you can break it down into non-renewable and renewable sources of energy. So non-renewable sources are the classic ones, the fossil fuels, right? As well as nuclear is also considered non-renewable. Non-renewable meaning that there's a finite amount of that resource available, and eventually we're going to use it up. It's not getting renewed. Uh, whereas renewable power, um, this is power that we're not going to run out of. It's always being produced. Uh, solar power, the sun's going to be shining for the next 10 billion years or something like that. We've got plenty of sunlight coming. As long as the rivers are flowing, we'll have that. Wind will keep blowing. Plants will keep growing. Earth will still be hot. So those are renewable sources. Um. I, I, I bet you probably get this question a lot. So, so as you said, if we only have 10 billion years left of sunlight left, why do they call it a renewable resource? Well, within uh, our own society's lifespan, we're not going to run out of sun, sunlight. 10 billion years is an unimaginable length of time. So, 
practicalities. Uh, so why don't we include hydrogen? I mean, you hear about hydrogen a lot as a fuel source. Um, anyone know why hydrogen's not on this list of a, as, a, as a resource? Well, there's no hydrogen mines out there, right? The place that we get hydrogen is by taking some other fuel, like petroleum, and converting it into hydrogen. There's nowhere you can go out into nature and access hydrogen like you can with petroleum or natural gas or something like that. You can mine. Any hydrogen that gets produced in our atmosphere, and quite a bit does, actually floats away into space. It's so light. The Earth's gravity doesn't hold on to it, and it's just lost forever. So hydrogen is really nice, but you have to spend energy to make hydrogen. So it's not a fuel source. It's a way to transfer energy. Okay, so when I talk about energy, uh, potential energy is really what we're talking about here. So if you've taken, ever taken a physics class, you probably talked about potential energies, kinetic energies, right? So the idea of potential energy is this rock up here in Utah has potential energy. It's balanced up there, and it's someday, at some point, there's going to be enough erosion that rock's going to fall down, right? So it's got potential energy. When the rock falls down to the ground, that potential energy will be turned into something else. Kinetic energy, and then the energy of destroying the small group of family who's camped under there. <laughs> okay, so when we say high potential energy, we're talking about a system that's inherently unstable, like that rock balanced on top of that uh, pinnacle. Uh, or a rock up on top of a building and has high potential energy. Unstable. Low potential energy is stable. You don't have to worry about it. It's not going to go anywhere. But high potential energy can do work. That's why it's useful. So an unstable system like this rock up here, if you put it in a pulley system, the weight of the rock falling can do some work. For example, it can lift those very happy people up onto the top of the building. See how happy they are? And so that's potential energy stored in that rock is now being used to do something cool. Right? So that's gravitational potential energy. Whereas the rock on the ground can't do any work, and look how sad he is about that. Okay? So low potential energy is where the system can't really do anything useful for us. So we also have chemical potential energy, so which is very similar to that rock on top of the building. But that potential energy is contained within chemical bonds, right? which Paolo can tell you all about, since he's in my class right now. Um, chemical bonds contain that potential energy, and we can release that through chemical reactions. So fuels with high potential energies, um, you know, methane, which is what natural gas is mostly made out of, coal, oil, hydrogen, ethanol, these are all high potential energy fuels. We can take them and, for example, uh, this is the compound that gasoline is partly made out of. We can combust that with oxygen to make carbon dioxide and water. And when this reaction happens, when we convert these unstable, high potential energy compounds into stable, low potential energy compounds, the difference in energy is released. And we can use that to do work. Okay, so carbon dioxide, water, sulfur dioxide, etc. Those are low potential energy um, end points, kind of like the rock on the ground. Um, so you gave kind of like a physics and science. I took a little bit of physics in high school, so I want to get a little bit more of an understanding. Okay. Um, are you saying that the reason why they have high potential energy is that once they are changed from one state to another, basically you know, high heat has, um, changes them from one state to another, that change state is no longer Easily changed yeah, yeah, that's kind of the idea. Except it's not the heat that's changing them. Well, it's the heat is coming out because of the change. Oh, right, yeah. right? So it's kind of like the rock falling down. The energy of the rock falling uh, is, is the heat that we're releasing. Or, or not necessarily even heat, but some form of energy can be released by that process. Right? So you've got these unstable compounds. They're unstable, like you mentioned, because they tend to interact with other molecules to, to, to react chemically. These products here, you know, we've had lots and lots of water on our planet for a very, very long time because it's very, very stable. It doesn't convert to other things. 
because it's got such a low potential energy. All of nature tends to want to go downhill, energetically speaking, low energy. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to take these high potential energy fuels and release their energy to do work for us. Well, how do we do that? So here is, anyone recognize this place here? Electric Beach. Yeah, Electric Beach is just right out here. So there's this, uh, this is the, called the Cahe Power Plants um, down on the dry side of the island that produces about half of our island's uh, energy. And this burns oil, crude oil. You pump crude oil directly into us. And then the, they use water to help with cooling. And they pull in water here, and they release water out here. And if you go snorkeling or, or diving out at the end of that pipe, there's this warm water that gets blown out of it, so all sorts of interesting marine life comes to see all sorts of stuff out there. Is the crude oil from the island, or do we ship it from the No, we ship it. We don't have any petroleum uh, wells or any kind of access, any resources on the island. We're the most oil-dependent state in the United States. And almost all of our power comes from oil that we have to bring in from various sources. Okay, so the way that we access that energy depends on Faraday's law of induction. That sounds sciencey, doesn't it? This is just the idea that if you have a circuit, so a wire, like a loop of wire, and you run a magnet, a permanent magnet, magnetic field, along that wire, you move it somehow, it will cause electrons in that wire to move around the wire. That's called electricity. It's a flow of electrons inside of a circuit. So you move this magnet up and down, you get some voltage, you get electric current flowing through the wire. So that's what we do. On a large scale, all you need then is some way to turn a wheel. You turn this shaft, and it turns this big magnet, and there's these wires looped around here, and, and, and the magnet turning within these wires creates the electric current. It gets transmitted to the rest of wherever it's needed. So all you need is some way to turn that crank. And that's all that our power generation is, different ways to turn the crank. So when you've got, so for most of them, what we do is we use steam power. All you, so you need some source of heat right here. In the case of oil, you just simply take the oil and you burn it with lots of oxygen. And the heat from burning that oil boils water in here. And um, anyone ever cooked something in a, a pot with a lid with a little hole, you know, those old kettles? What happens when it starts to boil? The steam starts coming out with a lot of force, actually. Um, because as you turn something like water into a vapor, the amount of space it takes up is a lot bigger. So it ends up causing pressure. So the pressure caused by boiling the water as the, as the steam, pressurized steam, is forced through this thing right here, it's called a turbine, it makes the turbine spin, and that's connected to your generator, and that makes power. So the different ways we have of generating power pretty much all come down to different ways of boiling water. So oil, burning coal, burning natural gas, it's all just about boiling that water. Is it, is it all boiling water, or is there other? There's other ways to go around it, yeah. For the most part, it's water because water is cheap and uh, abundant. But there's other other kinds of uh, coolants that you can use as well. All right. So, and, and this water is kind of in a closed loop, so it just travels around this loop. And then you have some kind of a reservoir here that's external. So this reservoir here, like here at Kahe, it's just ocean water they're using. That's why they often build power plants next to the ocean because you need some way to turn this steam back into water because it's that pressure change that you're looking for here. So you need some kind of a reservoir that can absorb that extra heat and then you push it back into a coolant tower or if you're in Hawaii, you just flow it back into the ocean. Is there a difference between using salt water and fresh water? Um, only in that the salt water tends to corrode the stuff that you're working with more. But um, in terms of its cooling capacity, it's pretty much the same. All right, so here's some diagrams of the turbine. They're pretty complicated machines, but you can see it's just like a big, very complex windmill. The water or the steam pushes through this and forces it to turn. So you've got these big things inside of, you know, big machines inside of big buildings that spin really fast and they 
electricity for us. Okay, so the fossil fuels, as I mentioned, these three main fuels right here. Oil is the one that we use for the most part in Hawaii. Uh, natural gas, coal. So let's talk about, for each of these uh, energy sources, I want to talk about some pros and cons. So what are the pros, what are the advantages of fossil fuels? Well, they're cheap, relatively, and still relatively abundant. Um, they have a fairly amount of high energy. There's a lot of infrastructure that's already there that's built to use these fuels. And it makes, um, get rid of that D right there, that's a typo, it makes centralized energy production at Nautical, as well as, it's true, it's decentralized energy production as well. You can have a small scale plant that generates power for a small community. You can have a large plant, generates power for a large community. It's scalable. Okay, what do you think we're going to say for when I go to the next slide? Cons. What kind of the, what are the disadvantages of fossil fuels? Carbon? Yeah, what's the problem with carbon? <coughs> What's, well, what, what's the form of carbon when, what happens to the carbon when we burn it? It turns into carbon dioxide, right? So what's the problem with carbon dioxide? Greenhouse. Greenhouse gas, right? So there's a lot of worries about climate change and things from all the greenhouse gas that's being emitted. Okay. What else? Um, accessibility. Sometimes we have to go, you know. Drill down and then drill yeah. to the side and drill to the other side. And right, so getting to it can cause lots of problems. Mm -hmm. and, and in the process of drilling it out of the ground and taking it where it needs to go, sometimes we spill it and screw up ecosystems, right? And of course, we also always also talk about limited resources. We are eventually going to run out of oil. But when that is, is still a matter of debate. For example, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, my teachers were telling me, oh yeah, we've got like 20 years left of oil and we're going to run out, then what are we going to do? And here we are 20, 30 years later, and now they're saying, yeah, we've got about 200 years of oil. Because we're coming up with new ways to access fuels we didn't really know were there, like um, methane um, solids that are down at the bottom of the ocean, and fracking and all sorts of different things. Anyway, so there's all sorts of political issues too. Um, the countries that have the oil have lots of money and power and sometimes those countries are not nice. Um, environmental problems, greenhouse gases, other kinds of pollution, right? So there's all sorts of problems with it. Um, again, so here's, here's our Kahe power plant, 650 megawatts. So this is kind of an interesting table, comparing these different fossil fuels and fossil fuel byproducts. Um, and I put hydrogen in there too, even though it's not really a fossil fuel, the way we make it is pretty much by burning a fossil fuel. So you can see here, so KWH has kilowatt hours. That's a measurement of how much <coughs> electricity. So if you pay a power bill, you look on the bottom of the bill, it tells you how many kilowatt hours uh, you've used. And so you can see per kilogram of fuel, the amount of energy available is quite a bit different. Hydrogen's got a lot of energy per kilogram. But if you look at it per liter, it's very different. Um, so here's something that a lot of you will be interested in, how much carbon dioxide gets emitted. And it might look like coal, this kind of coal produces the least amount of carbon dioxide, but that's just because this kind of coal uh, has a lot of junk in it, and so it takes a lot of that coal to make very much power. So this is the more useful column. So you can see that natural gas, methane, is the one that produces the least amount of carbon per kilowatt hour of power generated. And that's because the carbon and the methane is at the most reduced state. So, um, and coal is the highest anthracite. Um, you can also compare prices. How much do these things cost? Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty here because there's a lot of factors. But um, you can see that solar power can be very expensive. It can also be very cheap depending on how it's done. Some of these are cheap, but it did depend on location. We'll get into some of that. But this is in, in the number of cents you have to pay per kilowatt hour. So the US average is 13 cents per kilowatt hour, as of a couple months ago. Hawaii, it's almost three times that. That's not very fair, is it? 
Um, yeah, okay, so, and here's, I just pulled this off Hawaiian Electric's web page. These are the different power sources that we use on Oahu. So you've got, Hawaiian Electric has these three main power plants. Kahe is the one I just showed you, kind of over by Kapolei. Waiau is over by Pearl City. You can see it from the freeway. They generate most of the power for the island. There's also a biofuel plant over kind of by Kapolei as well. And then there's some other uh, sources like H-Power. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then independent power suppliers. There's several wind farms on the island. One just down the road from us. There's a few solar farms. And then consumer-sided solar. That's a big chunk right there. There's quite a bit of power available from just the people who have solar panels on the roofs. It's kind of cool. Um, this is the firm generation because that's what you can rely on. This very varies depending on whether the wind is blowing or the sun is shining. So anyway, renewable energy percentage is only about 20% in Hawaii. We want to make that higher, and we want to make our dependence on foreign oil lower. So there's a lot of different research going into that right now. Um, Nuclear power. So after fossil fuels, if you remember on our little list, nuclear power was the next biggest one. Now, we don't have any nuclear power on the island, which in my mind is kind of unfortunate, because that would solve a lot of our problems, but it uh, caused its own problems. So let's talk a little bit about nuclear power. So this is what an atom looks like, right? <coughs> no. So it's blue and yellow? <laughs> yeah, the colors, it's a, it's a Cub Scout atom, obviously. <laughs> um, this is a little too pretty. This isn't really what an atom looks like. It's more like maybe that, or that, or even this one here. Electrons behave in ways that are really, really weird. But that's not something we need to worry about very much. Atomic structure. So if you've taken science classes, you know that atoms are made out of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Right? So you've got this nucleus, where all the mass of the atom is. It's made out of protons and neutrons. Protons are positive. Neutrons are neutral, and they're all held together with this force called the nuclear strong force, which, as the name implies, is really, really strong. <laughs> There's a lot of energy there in that nucleus. The electrons surround the nucleus. So, a little thought experiment here. If we took a uranium, so uranium atoms, I'm talking about uranium, because that's the fuel we use for nuclear power. Right? So, a uranium nucleus, contains 92 protons and 143, ne 143 neutrons if it's that isotope of uranium. So if you take one atom and you blow it up so that the nucleus, protons and neutrons, is the size of a golf ball, where are the electrons? Well, to see where the electrons are for holding that golf ball in this room, we have to look at a satellite image. The electrons would be spread out there. This is our uranium atom. So, that's Laie, essentially. You've got Hukila uh, uh, Beach over here, um, PCC is right over here. So it's, it's a big area. You've got 92 little tiny electrons in there, and you've got a tiny nucleus the size of a golf ball right there, and the rest of it is just empty space. Most matter is just empty space. Crazy, right? Anyway, that's neither here nor there. So, the cool thing about uranium is that it's unstable. Oh, so you hear the word unstable, you think high potential, potential energy. energy. So this nucleus is at high potential energy. It's unstable, and it will spontaneously break apart. Little pieces of it go flying off. We call that radiation. So the uh, uranium-238 nucleus just spits off a little chunk with two protons and two neutrons. It goes flying off and it can be bad for you if you eat it. And it turns into something else, a different element. It turns into thorium, which is a little more stable. And so when that happens, there's some energy that's emitted, because it's going from higher to slightly lower potential energy. Now, some, some nuclei, including uranium-235, that's one particular isotope of uranium that has 143 neutrons, it's unstable in such a way that in the right conditions, it doesn't just break off little pieces of itself. The whole atom can break in half. So it can go from 
a very unstable, very high energy nucleus to two new nuclei that are much smaller and are themselves very stable. So you're going from very high potential energy to very low potential energy. And when that happens, when this splits, it kicks out two or three neutrons, just little pieces of it, little fragments come off. And those neutrons can crash into other uranium atoms. And when those ones break apart, they emit their own nuclei. And so what you have here is called a chain reaction. If you can get this process started in a sample of uranium of sufficient size, then it will very quickly turn the whole thing broken up into new elements and releasing scads of energy, gugobs of energy. And, you know, like atom bomb kind of energy. There's a huge amount of energy. These potential energy differences between the unstable nuclei and stable nuclei are enormous. There's a lot of energy in there. And so that's the energy we try and access to generate power. So here's how it works. It's the same thing. It's all just about how do we boil that water really efficiently. So you've got to react. And we won't get into the details there because that could take a whole um, lifetime to really learn. The reactor is where you have the uranium fuel that is undergoing a controlled chain reaction. It's emitting lots of heat, getting really hot. And you have some kind of uh, coolant that flows through the reactor. It's either water, or maybe it's molten salt, or it could be graphite that moves through here. And it moves into a reservoir of water, boils the water, the steam turns a turbine to make power. But this the fuel or the coolant that goes through the reactor is in a closed loop. It's not ever released to the surroundings. It's always contained inside of this closed loop. So the steam, the water in here, is totally separate. These pipes uh, contact each other, but there's no flow between one and the other. And this is also a closed loop. This water flows through here. And then you have another source to, to keep everything cool, like an ocean or rivers or whatever. Um, and uh, so, you, so in that way, you keep everything contained so that you don't have too many, um, you don't want to release the radioactivity. Because the problem is, when this happens, these elements that you release, some of them can be very, very hazardous, very, very toxic. So anyway, that's how nuclear power works. Um, one big problem with that is what we call uranium enrichment. You hear about that whenever you hear the news about some countries trying to develop nuclear power or a nuclear bomb or whatever. Um, the problem is that when you take uranium out of the ground, and it's actually not very hard to find, uranium, you can just dig it out of the ground. The problem is most of that uranium is uranium-238, which doesn't do fission. It just breaks those little pieces off of itself. It's actually pretty boring. <coughs> it's the uranium-235 we want, but only Less than 1% of uranium is uranium-235. So they both isotopes behave exactly the same in chemical reactions. The only difference between the two is uranium-238 is a little tiny bit heavier, about 1%. So it's kind of like, imagine you've got a big tub full of marbles. And the marbles are all the same color and the same shape. They look exactly the same, except this one's a little bit smaller than that one. Can you tell? It is, just a little bit smaller. Imagine you're trying to separate those marbles from each other in a big tub, but you have to wear oven mitts, and you're blindfolded. And it's not the tub of marbles, it's an ocean of marbles. That's the scale of the problem that we had to overcome to figure out how to do nuclear power. So back in 1940s, there was um, something called the Manhattan Project that involved literally hundreds of thousands of people and the smartest scientists of the 1900s, and millions and millions of dollars in funds to figure out how to solve this problem. And it took a lot of work. Eventually, we figured it out. Um, in any case, nuclear power, pros and cons. The pros, first of all, it's safe. Now, you might, that might sound weird, right? Because you hear about, like, Chernobyl, or you hear about Fukushima in Japan, some of those accidents that have happened. Um, in reality, nuclear power is far more safe than coal or anything like that, or even wind power. A lot fewer people have been killed in nuclear power accidents than have been killed working on wind farms. Crazy, right? 
So if it's done right, it's safe. Uh, there's no greenhouse gas produced. Uh, very little pollution if it's done right. Um, you get a very high amount of energy from a very small amount of fuel. Um, and it may be possible to extract uranium from seawater. There's a lot of uranium dissolved in the sea. And so we could make this whole process very sustainable because there's a lot enough uranium in there to, to provide all of our needs. But of course, there's problems too. It's complex, uh, takes very large power plants and um, a very rich government to be able to build these kind of things. Meltdowns can have really big consequences. Chernobyl happened 30 years ago. That area is still unlivable and will be for some time. Um, there's no way that the toxic waste, the nuclear waste from a reactor, there's nothing you can do to it that will make it unhazardous. You can't burn it and turn it into something else. Our only solution with this stuff is bury it in a big hole and wait a thousand years. That's the only thing we can do with it. So that's a big problem, the toxic waste. Anyway, um, hydroelectric power. Oh, yes. Uh, is there currently research to try to convert that highly toxic Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, lots of research going on in these fields. And so we figured out ways to take some of that waste and turn it back into a different kind of nuclear fuel that you can then continue to use. Some of it can be recycled, some of it can. not So, so far we haven't figured out anything you can do to it to make it non-toxic. Hydroelectric power is our next one. Right, so this is cool. You're just using water to turn your turbines, right? You don't have to boil it. You just have water that's up high, and it wants to go down low. It's just gravitational potential energy. You make that water up high, run through a sluice with a turbine in it, and you use the gravity to turn the turbine to generate power. Very simple and straightforward. Um, and lots of power is available through this. So pros, it's inexpensive once you build those dams. Um, with minimal um, maintenance, they continue to produce a lot of power. No pollution, no greenhouse gases. Um, it's a very flexible energy source. You can, you can adjust these sluice gates to let in as much or as little water as you want to generate power, okay, so which is really cool. But on the other hand, building a dam screws up the ecosystem, right? You're usually flooding an area that it was an ecosystem. You're flooding with water. You're displacing people. You're displacing Wildlife, um, it's expensive to build, messes up, messes up fish habitats and so on. A lot of dams that were built in the mid-1900s are now being taken out because, because of the environmental problems that they cause. So, here's an example. The Three Gorges Dam in China is the biggest power plant in the world. It produces 22,500 megawatts. That's 35 times more than Oahu's biggest power plant. And it's this huge project that took 20-something years to build, um, and it produces a lot of power for relatively cheap, but at a cost. There was over a million people that had to get displaced for this thing to be built. Uh, wind power, let's talk about wind power a little bit. We have that on the island, right? So wind power is straightforward. You have this thing, this windmill that turns, and it's just connected to the generator. So you don't have to boil water, you don't have to worry about water at all. The wind turns the turbine for you, directly generates power. It's very simple and straightforward. So it's clean, it's sustainable, it's abundant and free. Right? You don't have to pay anything to get your wind, it'll always be blowing. You can build your wind farms far offshore. You can build them far enough away from the shore that nobody can see them from the shore. And then you don't have to worry about, some people don't like the look of them. So there's a lot of advantages to them. They're relatively cheap as well. But there's also problems. Um, you have to put a lot of money in to get this, the project going. And you only have power when the wind is blowing. So you have to have backup power sources. Nobody has a power grid that's based only on wind. Because when the wind stops blowing, you don't have the power. You have to have backup systems that are doing something like burning coal or oil. You can't store this energy easily. Um, the Kahuku wind farm used to have a big battery plant that would charge up, uh, and it caught fire and burned up and caused all sorts of pollution problems. Uh, they're not very popular with nearby communities. You may have seen signs around Kahuku, because uh, people have talked about putting more windmills in, and people 
and Kahuku really don't like that. If you've been close to them, they're pretty noisy. You can hear them. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. They're big, they're um, unsightly in some people's minds. They kill a lot of birds. Did you know that? They do. They kill a lot of birds. Certainly not more birds than are killed by power plants, you know, burning oil or whatever, but they do kill birds. Poor birds. Um, the biggest wind farm in the world is in China. Um, this wind farm has eight or 5,000 turbines, and they're planning to more than double that. It's out in the Gobi Desert. And that's the other problem with wind power, is the places where you can build a giant wind farm with lots of windmills are generally a long ways away from the places where people need to use that power. So you have to run electricity through power lines long distances, and you lose some of that energy by transmitting it through power lines. Just out of interest, these are the largest wind turbines in the world. This is in a wind farm uh, offshore from London, from England. Each of these things is um, 722 feet tall. So to compare that, the tallest building in Honolulu is like 450 feet tall. So if you put one of these in Honolulu, it would dwarf any building in the city. Wow. They're enormous. This red thing is like a full-size building right there. Gigantic things. Um, nine megawatts each. So you would need 72 of these monsters to replace our Kahe power plant to produce the same power that it produces. So it, it takes a lot of windmills to generate a lot of power. So is, is that thing built over the ocean? Yeah, they're right in the ocean. So this is, these things, these pylons go way down deep um, and they're just right here in the ocean. So we could do this in Hawaii too. You could build a wind farm 20 miles off the shore and no one would be able to see it because the horizon, it would be over the horizon. And uh, sending power through power lines 20 miles long is no big deal. It's just a big expense to start the project. Oh, we're almost out of time. Whoa. Uh, just real quick, solar power is cool. <laughs> There's two ways to do it, though. Photovoltaics, which is a panel that things we're not going to be able to discuss. Electricity gets produced when sunlight lands on the panel. It's actually the reverse of an LED light. Like a little LED light, like on your, on your cell phone, the little light back there, that's an LED. It works, the way an LED works is you force electricity through the LED and light comes out. This is the opposite. You force light into the panel and electricity gets made. Same kind of thing, it's just like an inverted um, LED light. This is different, you've got a whole bunch of mirrors that take sunlight and focus it on this tower. It's all the sunlight in this area is focused on that one point right there. And then you put something like salt in there, and there's enough heat to melt the salt, and you flow the salt down to a uh, reservoir down here, and you boil water with it, and you use the steam to turn a turbine. So you're not, it's, this is um, more sustainable, it's, it's more um, longer lasting, because these panels are just mirrors. These are complicated uh, diode arrays that cost a lot more to make. This is cheaper to, and a little bit more efficient. What kind of material those mirrors make? Oh, glass and reflective surfaces. I don't know. It depends on the mirror. Just they're just mirrors, though. Do they replace them like frequently? Because you don't have to replace them very often. That's the thing, because it's just a mirror. These you have to replace a lot more frequently, because they wear out after five or ten years. These last like 20, 30 years. Or something. Uh, but you can imagine if birds fly by right around there, they get turned into uh, charcoal. <laughs> okay, so we're out of time. Uh, any more questions? We didn't get time to talk about um, geothermal power. Maybe I should mention geothermal is cool because we have this in Hawaii. We're using the power of the earth. So Old Faithful, for example, sprays out high-pressured steam every hour or two. That's the idea. You've got down in the earth, you have hotness. And if we can access that heat, then we can... Boil water. That's what it's all about again. So what you do is you drill down until you find a place where there's a reservoir of very hot superheated water. You just tap into that. The water steam blasts up. You use that steam to turn a turbine, generate power, and then you flow that water after you cool it down back into the ground. So somewhere that has very hot ground, relatively shallowly like the Big Island, can do this. So we have a power plant, a couple of them, on the Big Island. This is the Puna Geothermal Venture here, and that's exactly what they do. Um, so they generate 38 megawatts, that's uh, 
13% of the Big Island's power needs just comes from geothermal. And it's awesome because it's totally clean. There's no pollution. It's free power. Well, it's, it's free heat anyway. You just have to access it. So I'll, I, I'd love to see more geothermal in the future. The problem is if you're somewhere where there isn't a volcano nearby, you have to drill down really, really deep, like tens of kilometers, to get deep enough to access enough heat. And then by the time that heat gets all the way up to your power plant, it's not so hot anymore. So, anyway, so it's great if you're in the right location. Otherwise, um, you've got some limitations. Biomass is the last one I was going to mention. Um, on, in Hawaii, did you know we burn most of our garbage? Most of the trash goes into this power plant uh, called H-Power over by Kapolei. And we burn it, and we generate quite a bit of power from our garbage. I was actually talking to several professors about this, and one was visiting one from BYU, and they're talking about how we don't actually burn too much. There's still a lot going into the landfill, and we're importing fuel from the mainland just to use the incinerator to continue using it. Why is it that we aren't burning all of the rubbish? Oh, I haven't heard that. Okay, well, I just want to Yeah, so that, that would be a major issue, wouldn't it? You have to import... But I mean, do people pay us to take their garbage and we burn it? No, it's fuel. It's That's fuel, garbage. okay. So and so we're still it. using landfill and we be burning it. And I was going to ask you. But as I understood, we're, we burn something like 70-80% uh, of our garbage in this. And it gets rid of a lot of our trash because we don't have the landfill space for it. So that's a, that's a plus to it. But yeah, there's, there's, a, there's other things as well to it. Other political issues. Um, the idea, at least, is a good one whether or not it's implemented wisely. So I'm going to let you guys go since we probably have other classes to get to. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. And um, go electricity. <laughs>